Uh, hello everyone, um, my name is Katie Steckles, I am a mathematician and many of you probably have seen me before at these events or otherwise in the world of maths or on the internet. Um, this is an event run by Talking Maths in Public which is an organisation for people who communicate maths in various different forms to get together and share skills and network and connect and make friends and uh, during lockdown we've run Talking Maths in Lockdown. This is the fifth session out of six um, and today's session is about learning new skills. Uh, so before we go into that, I'm going to quickly just throw to each of the T-Mill committee to tell, say a little bit about themselves. And I would like you to also include a new skill that you have learned during lockdown. So first of all, Kevin. Uh, hi, I'm Kevin Houston. I'm a lecturer at the University of Leeds. I'm also the Education Secretary of the London Mathematical Society. So please join. Um, and I've started just this week, so I've not got very far with it. I've started learning Python because I think I have to. <laughs> good, good. Um, over to Sam. Hi, I'm Sam Durbin. Um, when I'm not furloughed, I work at the Royal Institution and I manage our secondary mathematics masterclass program. So I work with a fair few people on this call anyway. Um, I'm also involved in TMIP and a couple of other things. And the new skill that I started picking up when lockdown happened was making videos for the first time, which I'd never done before and subtitling them and trying to make them accessible and think of ways for people to engage if they found just watching a video wasn't quite right for them. So, and not, again, I've not done much of it since, since furlough happened, but it is a skill that I've been slowly trying to pick up. Cool, that's good. I don't know if we briefed anyone on this, but you know, we seem to be hitting all of the uh, topics that we're actually going to cover in today's session as well here, so this has gone well. Uh, and finally, Ben? Hi, I'm Ben Sparks. I work uh, in Bath, or I live in Bath. I seem to never leave Bath now, which is normal. I work for the AMSP, the Advanced Math Support Programme. For half my time, I was a maths teacher for 10 years in secondary schools, and I'm also based a tiny bit at the University of Bath doing maths communication module with some students there and in the freelance bit of my life I do maths talks as well to teachers and students occasionally online uh, the number file thing and uh, embarrassingly the podcast that Brady's just released on that was with me yesterday it's galling to hear your biography go live on the internet but uh, the new skill I've done in lockdown um, forced on me was uh, Ed Southall who some of you might know from maths education twitter decided to try and do a cover of a Tom Lehrer video with lots of mass communicators singing each line. And uh, then Muggs, Muggins here decided to volunteer to learn how to edit audio and video all at once, having not really done a lot of that. So new skill was uh, figuring out how to use proper microphones and recording equipment and editing video and audio, which was good. But, you know, learning stuff is hard, which is why we've got people to talk about it, right? So, um, so I, I mean, I feel like I should probably also answer this question, given that I've imposed it on everyone else, but um, I've kind of struggled to pick out one particular thing. I think partly because my job before this consisted of working from home remotely and doing things on the internet. So I've kind of already had some of those things, but I feel like what I've essentially done is just refined my skills in a lot of things. So like, for instance, I know a lot more things that Slack can do now. Uh, like I've learned loads of really useful shortcuts in Slack. Did you know you can get it to remind you of something like in a week's time? If someone sends you a message, as if can you do this? And you're like, oh, I'll have to do that next week. Remind me in a week and Slack will just message you in a week's time. So many new things. Anyway, um, so for uh, this session today, we are talking about new skills. So essentially, since lockdown has happened, a lot of people have either been forced by circumstances to very rapidly learn how to do new things, uh, or alternatively have found themselves with a little bit of extra time and space to uh, be able to learn new things kind of by choice. Um, and it's a really good thing to do if you've got the opportunity to do that, obviously, I'm not implying that everyone is sitting around doing nothing all day. A lot of people are finding themselves a lot more busy during this time, and I'm very much uh, in that category. Um, but, you know, it could be anything from practical skills like, you know, making and editing videos uh, or, or things that you've just kind of been meaning to teach yourself how to do for a while but not had the chance. Um, and some people have been adapting the stuff that they already did and the skills that they already had to a new format, I guess, which is part of this as well. Um, and today we've invited three guests to share their various different views on this and their different experiences of this kind of thing. Um, so there'll be people uh, talking about things that they've 
learned for themselves and how that's gone uh, and people sharing ways for you to pick up new skills um, that you might find useful. We're also going to try and put together another one of our wonderful editable Google documents like we have on some of these other sessions uh, where we'll collect some links and resources and things for people who want to learn new things. So if there are any useful resources of that nature that you uh, can think of, feel free to drop them into the chat. Um, and we'll try and collate those things. We'll also share a link to the doc when it's uh, in a bit more shape so that you can add things in there as well. Um, so as usual, we are going to have three people saying a little bit about themselves for five to ten minutes, followed by a bit of Q&A. When it gets to four o'clock, we will have a, a sort of opportunity for people who need to head off at four o'clock to do that. Um, but we may continue onwards with whichever subset of the speakers are able to stick around uh, until 4.30 um, and having some sort of general discussion Q&A type stuff. Um, we are going to record, we are currently recording the, the session with the speakers in the Q&A. If you're worried about appearing on that, just make sure that your video is muted and you definitely won't appear. Um, and if you do want to ask any questions, we're going to use the chat box uh, as a way to do that. So if you put your questions in there, uh, the person who's coordinating the Q&A, which is scrolling down a document, Sam, uh, will be able to pick out questions from there and, uh, and read them out for you. Um, so for all of our online events and real world events, we do have a code of conduct. Um, Sam's going to paste the link to that in the chat now. Um, if you uh, would take a look at that, that would be excellent. Essentially, it says be welcoming, be polite, be considerate, be respectful, uh, try to use gender neutral language. Um, and remember that people are sharing things within this call for the purposes of this call. If you would like to share anything that you experience or see or hear during this uh, outside of this call, me make sure that the person who shared it is okay with that. Um, so hopefully that is all of the introductory things. So I'm now gonna hand over to Ben who is gonna introduce our speakers. Thanks Katie. Uh, just uh, in case you haven't spotted it already, we have three speakers lined up for you within the next few minutes, uh, which are James Grime, and then Fran Scott, and then Anne-Marie Imaphodon. So we're going to go in, in that order, and I'll say a little bit about each speaker first. Um, so James will be with you in a moment, but if you have not heard of James Grime, then you've missed a lot of maths on the internet over the last few years, um, and it is worth catching up with his YouTube channel, for example, Singing Banana, is where James made his uh, YouTube debut, and he's still laughing about that, and I can see his face. Uh, also very very well known from the number file YouTube channel doing lots of maths. Um, I've been told to basically introduce him as an internet sensation. That is apparently how they get described in various things. Uh, he didn't tell me that, I hasten to add. And uh, I'll let him explain what new skills he's been learning, but uh, his previous skills were lots of real world workshops and talks to lots of people. So if I hand over to James and uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Okay, right, I'll get started. So hey to everyone, hi everyone. Yeah, to introduce myself quickly, uh, yeah, so I'm James, I'm a mathematician, and my day job is I travel around the UK and I visit schools. And I do uh, like uh, workshops in schools, they have a maths day with me. It's normally about code breaking, and I do that uh, freelance. Uh, and, and I do things on YouTube, right, which, which is very popular, it's very nice, but that's not how I earn my living. So when the lockdown happened, uh, it was a genuine problem uh, because I'm not being furloughed or anything like that. Boom, suddenly I'm making no money at all. Uh, so I had to find a way of making a living. And um, the only idea I had was to do an online course. Uh, so I do uh, a course in the summer. I, I work with Cambridge Summer Schools. And Cambridge Summer Schools is where they have adult learners and they have international students and they come to Cambridge and they have the Cambridge experience, which is real good fun. And they come and be at Cambridge University and they take courses. And so I'm involved with that. And I like doing that. And I, I like to keep, you know, a hand in or at least a toe in, you know, the lecturing academic world. So I thought, well, the path of least resistance is I do that course, which I've already prepared and I already know, but I do that online. Uh, so that's what I started to investigate. And I started to look into the tech to do that online. And to be honest with you, I was looking for an excuse not to do it. So I was looking into the tech and I was hoping that there would be some insurmountable problem. That means I did not have to do that. Uh, however, I did not find any excuse not to do it. Uh, so I did end up doing this. Uh, so I might as well uh, start talking about 
some of the tech I had to uh, learn and look up. The first, of course, is uh, Zoom, which we all know, so I don't need to introduce it. So Zoom, you know, suddenly everyone's using Zoom. Uh, what I wanted to do is um, I wanted to be doing this live and I wanted to be doing it with interaction like it's a real classroom. Uh, so I could be putting this stuff up on YouTube, but I don't do that uh, because, partly because I already do that and that stuff is already there, uh, partly because there's no money in YouTube. And people might think there's money in YouTube, but there's no money in YouTube. Uh, and I don't make a living from YouTube, that's important. And uh, also, it's very impersonal. You know, it, it would be speaking to a camera and it wouldn't be uh, interacting with people as if in a classroom. So I looked into Zoom and it works a treat, doesn't it? Um, I mean, you interact with people. Uh, so that was great. That's one problem solved. Uh, I know people were arguing about security with Zoom. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't see it being a massive problem for what I was doing, but I did sign up for the pro version. Uh, which means that I could have unlimited lectures, so I wasn't limited to the 40 minutes, and it gave me some extra security features, so I did use that, and of course it was a, there was a month free trial, uh, which, by the way, I signed up for a month ago, so I've actually, today I got charged the first time, which was 15 quid or something. Uh, so that was one problem. The other problem was, when I do this in Cambridge, my style is lecture with notes, but notes with gaps. So what I do is in at the beginning of each lecture, I give the students the lecture notes for that lecture, but it's notes with gaps. So it has all the waffle, it has all the English. I don't want, to have, I don't want them to be sitting down, you know, trying to keep up writing the English stuff, but the maths, the actual important stuff is taken out. So they do have to be engaging their brain, thinking about it. Uh, so that's how I did it live. So I thought, okay, so how am I going to translate that to online? One option is, of course, is to completely rewrite what I do and PowerPoint it or something. Ideally, I don't want to do that because that would be a lot of work. I mean, if I cannot do that, that'd be good. Uh, so what it would be nice is if I could give them the notes for them to download, then they would have the notes with gaps. Uh, they could then either print them or tablet, use a tablet, you know, try and save some trees, use a tablet. So obviously we can do that. But that means I need to be able to share my notes on the screen and then fill in the notes as I go along. So a couple of things I had to learn to do that. Um, I needed a kind of a, like a stylus thing. Um, which means I needed to get, well, possibly do I have to buy a tablet? And I don't own a tablet. And I looked into buying a tablet, especially the type with the, the stylus. And they seem to be very expensive. Uh, so I did not buy a tablet. So I've got an alternative to a tablet to do this, which is one of these. It's just um, like a trackpad kind of thing, which you plug in with a USB into your computer comes with a pen and then you would write on it like you would with a tablet but it's a slightly cheaper alternative to that. I'll tell you what it is, it's, uh, it's called an XP pen and it works cheap. Uh, so I liked it. There is two versions, I bought the, the first version I bought was a small version which was quarter the size and you would think that the technology would be able to work so that I could just write on it normally and then it would rescale your writing and and I tried and it didn't. I had to write tiny on a tiny square. I had to write tiny. So that was no good. So this is essentially A4 size and then I just write normal and it works really well. Then I had to find the tech so that I could have my PDF on the screen and I could write on it with handwriting. Uh, so I looked into the programs that could do that and there's a few around and none of them were any good for me, I, I think. I mean, I don't know if Adobe version is good, but you pay for that. So I, don't, I couldn't find anything that really worked except something called 
Zodu, and and it re and I recommend it because it worked exactly what I wanted it to do. And so I'm going to share Zodu, show you what it is. So if I can share that, so this by lecture like this. So Zodu, you can see in the top left corner. So it's X O D O free. It's it's actually um I think it's a browser thing. I think there is something you download, but it's a browser thing. So this is in my Chrome browser, and then and that's what my handwriting looks like. So I can I can just write things as I go along. So that was lovely. So I do recommend that. The next problem is uh, infrastructure. So how do I take payments for this? Um, so I want there to be a website that is set up for this where you know you can run a course and it has like infrastructure like a Moodle thing so you can have your files up there so your students can um, pay as well so it will take PayPal and things. I didn't find anything that worked for me. Um, Coursera is a thing and I looked into that and I didn't quite understand it and I didn't quite understand how I would make money from it because they seem to do the courses for free um, or most of the courses there for free uh, so I didn't quite understand that uh, so I didn't do that so I actually signed up for Shopify so another website called Shopify and again recommend it um, worked really well so Shopify super easy way to make an online shop and so you sign up for that and uh, it takes PayPal payments, it takes online payments, you know, your credit card kind of payments, or does all that for you. You create a product, which for me was uh, introduction to cryptography course, June the 1st. And then people click on that, and then they click on payment, and it's done. And then I get their details as well. So I get their emails, and the Shopify will... Uh, email confirmation emails and uh, fulfillment emails. So, um, and it's really easy actually. So again, recommend it. And it was a three month free trial for that. So I've not paid for that yet either. Um, it, they take a 2% transaction fee. Brilliant, fine, happy with that. No problem at all. So it's all kind of cobbled together from various free services that are available. So the Shopify thing to take payments, uh, the Zodu for being able to actually give my course the way I want to give it, the Zoom for being able to deliver it. Uh, but put those things together, it is a bit of a mishmash, but actually worked quite well in the end because it was a success. Uh, so I, the other thing I had to work out was how much to charge, uh, which makes me embarrassed because I'm pretty embarrassed about money and so I looked up how much to charge for online courses and the advice online that I found was to charge 20 to 30 pound per hour and they say don't undervalue your worth and that's all I, everything I agree with and everything I believe in I totally but that meant for what I was doing uh, I was doing a seven hour, seven and a half hour course. It was like one a day, kind of nice setup. Uh, I would have had to charge 200 quid for this. Uh, so I was thinking, okay, maybe I'm supposed to be charging 175 quid, if that's what the advice was. And then at the last minute, I went, no, that's ridiculous. I don't, I'm not happy with that at all. So I changed it to 75 quid. And I think that was the right choice. Um, for a start, I got no complaints for 75 quid, apart from the people who expect things for free. Uh, but 75 quid, which is 10 pounds an hour, essentially, um, seemed to feel right. Because, of course, part of this is, this is just meant to be a bit of fun as well. Something for people to do in lockdown. Something that's different for them to give them a bit of structure in their day. Something for me to have a bit of fun and give a bit of structure in my day. And I think that turned out to be the right choice. Um, but uh, actually delivering the lectures turned out to be uh, a success. So loved the Zoom. The interaction felt very natural, felt like a classroom, gave structure to my day. 
we all got, you know, it was small groups of people. Um, these courses were only 10 people, uh, so it wasn't meant to be a mass thing, and it wasn't meant to be a mass thing. So it's real genuine interaction. You know, we all got on and chatted away really nicely. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, that was, that was great. The failure, maybe the biggest failure from it was promoting it because I'm embarrassed about promoting myself. Uh, and I did, not, I did not find that comfortable at all. Uh, and this is, to be honest, with the advantage of having Twitter followers, which other people may not have. And I, yeah, I do. And I find promoting things on Twitter isn't that successful. You promote your thing on Twitter and you get very little actual um, you know, reaction from that. Um, I mean, you get reaction of people go, oh, yeah, what a good idea, but not actually people who see that through. Uh, and that's my experience. So, yeah, I, you know, it wasn't a huge follow up. And I felt embarrassed because then I kind of felt like I had to mention it every day or something just because people didn't see it. And so you have to mention it again. And I wasn't very good at that. And maybe I would have more success if I ran run this through Coursera where you'd be in a directory or something or run it through a university where the university is promoting the thing for you. And it's less of less personal, less me promoting myself or you know, the university promoting something else. Uh, but I will consider that a successful experiment. And I think we're in kind of a new normal now. So if people are getting used to this, you know, where things are happening online and I think this will be happening more in the future. People are more used to it in the future. So it is something that I'm going to start folding in to what I already do. Brilliant, James. Thank you very much. In summary, James has solved all sorts of problems to do with Zoom, uh, graphics, tablets, uh, networking software, handwriting on a computer, getting money, how much money and advertising. And I think uh, there was a tweet about that course. Just, I, I did see James do a bump for that course because there's, there's one more version of it. Is that right? Yeah, sorry, sorry I'll just muted myself for a second. Yes, no I've, I've run it. I've run it twice, I'm running it again next week. And then I might uh, stop for now. I'm sure there'll be other chances uh, as James says, the new normal, who knows how long this goes on for. So look out for James doing more of those uh, and particularly look out for him being embarrassed about asking you for money because uh, he's not the only one that feels like that. That is a problem freelancers have to tackle and plenty of things uh, to, to talk to James about in a bit, but let's give a chance to our other two speakers. So I'm going to go to Fran Scott next. Um, Fran works for the Royal Institution as well as part-time freelance, as I understand it. I'm sure she'll give us some more details, but you may have seen her face on TV, Dick and Dom's Absolute Genius in the past, but recently on the Lego Masters course. Also behind the scenes wizardry for the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, uh, recently when Hannah Fry was doing that, which possibly got more maths people watching than uh, than necessarily before. Uh, but I'm not going to say too much more. Fran apparently has been learning how to film with minimal equipment, and hopefully she can tell us more about that. So over to you, Fran. Um, so hello everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a bit of a funny bunny in terms of I have sort of three jobs basically. So I work at the RI where I'm currently furloughed and then I'm just going to put it so I don't see my face because no one likes seeing their face. And um, so I'm currently furloughed at the RI but I head up their um, demo department basically. So like yes I'm involved in the Christmas lectures, their international tour. I also do um, engineering presenting and science presenting on telly and I've done that for about 10 years now. But I also run my own business, which is events production company, um, where I train other scientists to present. And then we're a white label company. So we work with um, companies such as National Grid to get science around to schools and trade shows are always free at the point of entry. So that's basically what I do. But um, what I want to describe to you is sort of what I've been... <laughs> trying to help people with during lockdown, right? Because during lockdown, basically overnight, we all had to, we all had to become presenters. And so whether we were used to just meeting face to face or presenting on stage, you now had to present to this small camera that was on your screen. And this, it was really weird for people because yes, I'm a presenter, I've done this for years and years, but 
it riled me for a few reasons, right? Because basically there are some types of people that have had this experience, you know, myself included. And there's been those people that, you know, have had the time and the money to be able to afford the fancy lights and the fancy microphone. And what happened during lockdown was it was those people then had the advantage during a very uncertain time. And it got me thinking that, and this is a very sweeping statement, that those types of people, including myself, you know, they don't need the advantage. And so it got me thinking about what about these people who have never had the courage to make that leap to present, um, or they just don't want to, you know, what about those people? What about those people that literally just have their phone? What, what are they meant to do? Um, and, you know, and there's so much advice on there and YouTube and like, oh, buy this light, do this, do this. And, it's do, and people are like, I just don't, I don't have the money and I don't know how to use it. Um, and it was actually the RI that got me thinking about this. So the RI, we started some online films and um, teaching people at the RI, including Sam, actually, it was really interesting because it became known to me that I knew stuff that I didn't know everyone knew if you know what I mean. So like I was telling them stuff and people were going, oh, this is really, really helpful. And I was like, oh, really? And so it's sort of, there was stuff that I knew that I thought everyone knew, but they didn't. And I thought, well, actually, maybe I can be helpful during lockdown. Um, so um, I just want to make a bit of a disclaimer here in that I am one of those people that has the fancy lights and stuff like that. And I've actually set up um, my setup now to show you how fancy because for my business what I also do is I do um, keynote speeches for big corporates and things like that so I need to look high-end but all honesty for 80% of what I and you do you don't need any of this fancy equipment right you can do stuff just basically using your phone um, so what I want to do is sort of go through sort of five top tips about how you can produce videos that don't look rubbish and actually look good using minimal equipment, right? So tip one is basically it's the content that matters, right? So many people, um, they'll start researching cameras and lights before they actually think about what they is that they want to film. Now, <laughs> the content that you actually say into the camera is so much more important than the type of camera that you're saying it into. Um, so basically think about what it is that you are putting online. Maybe it's something like James that you normally do face to face. Maybe it's a classroom session. Maybe it's just a meeting. Maybe it's a keynote speech and um, whatever it is, think about, you know, how you would actually make that into essentially a small television show it becomes. And basically the secret to presenting on camera rather than face to face is <laughs> your audience is much more fickle um, because they can switch you off so easily. Whereas it takes effort to walk out of a meeting. It takes effort to walk out of a theater. You know, you just switching off a video and I'm sure we've all done it on YouTube and um, where you just go, oh no, I'm bored. And you, and you would never do that. You know, you would never yawn when you're watching a theater, you know? So basically it's much more difficult to keep an online audience engaged than it is an audience when you're face to face. So what you've got to do with that is, and I'm not very good at this, but um, you just got to get to the point, right? So you have got to cut out everything that's unnecessary, everything. And this can be really, really hard. And I've sort of had this experience of working behind the scenes in TV in terms of sometimes I get three minutes to be able to say a scientific theory. And so, what you've got to do is you've got to understand the whole of the thing that you're trying to say and then you know which bits you can miss out and the story still makes sense. So literally try and pare it down to what it is that your audience need to know to be able to follow you through on your story. And that might be a fair bit because the story you might want to say might be long. Um, but so try and really, really think about what it is that you have to say. Um, and when I say miss out everything unnecessary, it's really interesting because that's sort of from the content wise, but what you still got to include is the human side of it, because that's how you get engagement through a camera. Um, because you probably watch these and I know that I have sometimes like YouTube videos where it's just a robotic voice done and they're just not engaging because as humans, you know, we're social creatures. 
and not one of us is getting enough human social interactivity at the moment so you keep the human side you know keep the humor keep the surprise keep the laughter keep the mistakes and that will keep people engaged um, but really really think about the facts that you need to tell people um, so that's my first my first one I would say and um, my second one is and this is sort of like a bit of an eye roll moment you know how to film with minimal equipment I'm going to tell you to buy something um, or not necessarily right so I bought this in the first week of lockdown and it's sort of like a tripod selfie stick thing right with an inbuilt light and a little microphone now i don't have shares in the company but basically support your phone come up with a way that you can put your phone so it's at your eye level and think about the lighting so basically that does it all in one but what you can do is if you've got like a little pop socket on your phone, you can hook it over a mug, stack it on some books, put a desk light behind it. You want to try and make sure that you've got a light as close to where your, your camera is on your phone as you can. And, um, and so just support your phone. You don't need to spend money. That's like 13 quid. And it was the one that had the most features for the minimal money. I'm from Yorkshire, so it's all about that, um, that I could find. And it's really... I found it really, really helpful. Um, so yeah, support your phone. Um, and the next thing would be, think about where you film, right? Now, <laughs> I can imagine you guys are a bit like me in terms of you think, oh, well, does that really matter? You know, isn't it a bit superficial? Isn't it about me just what I say? And it is, but basically, you're trying to get your message across to your audience, right? And you'd be surprised how much other stuff your audience subconsciously absorbs. And, um, and so what you want to do is you want to make sure that they're concentrating on your message because communication only happens when it's received by the other end. So you want to make sure that they're not distracted by other things. So um, spend, make sure you spend time to think about where you film. And that there's a few things in that. So basically it's about lighting as well. So that's why I've sort of got my setup done as I would for like a professional talk. So here, I'll, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a tour, right? So I am, um, it's a bit of a weird setup. So I'm currently, I've merged households with my boyfriend and I had to move here by bike. So I hardly have any belongings with me um, and stuff I've got delivered here for my filming. And so I'm currently filming, we've got a rent reduction at the moment, so I'm filming in a spare bedroom. Um, so I can show you, so there's a window and I've got the blind down on the window because otherwise it would shine on my face. And then we've got a bookshelf behind me with a few things that I got for Christmas. And then it's just empty bookshelves, right? And then to the other side, we've got the mattress bed that we had and my desk is currently made of the headboard of that bed, right? So, basically you don't need anything fancy and all you need to look good is this little area that's right behind you the rest of the room can look an absolute tip and um and so you see like it looks fine you can just see that shelf right you don't know that there's all this stuff everywhere um and so yeah really really think about that background because as you are probably distracted by people on, on have i got news for you or the news with their background there's certain things you can do to make it much less distracting and just add that layer of professionalism and who doesn't want to look professional um fran i'm just going to give you a quick warning um to make sure we've got time for q a afterwards uh going to give you one more minute and then we'll save everything else for to be discussed afterwards if that's fair okay. enough fair enough um moving swiftly on um sorry i'm a talker um think about your sound that's why we're here fran it's okay <laughs> Um, yeah, do think about your sound. Um, you can even, um, so most modern phones, I was really lucky, I bought a new one at Christmas, and they, their microphones are actually quite good, but you can use Bluetooth headphones um, if you want to film from a distance. And finally, practice. Um, it's, people are very, very self-conscious to film themselves practicing because filming is seen as a bit of a treat. And so it's not seen as work and see like, well, actually I've got work to do. I won't, you know, be so self-absorbed that I'm going to film myself practicing, but actually you'll get better at it. Imagine going into a classroom, not having prepared. Um, yes, it's embarrassing. Yes, you'll feel like a fool. Yes, you'll hate watching yourself back, but you will get better at it because that's 
And that's what you want to do. You want to do something well. Um, and remember, last, last point, last point, um, people don't want perfection, right? Especially in these times, people are actually looking at something that is super perfect with suspicion. Um, they, people want people, people want people to have made mistakes. They want to be like, oh, hang on, look, oh, I've got a mattress here. I've got, you know, it's like, just be you and have fun with it. Um, because everyone knows they're just trying their best with what they've got at the moment. Brilliant. Thank you, Fran. There's plenty more to ask Fran about. Um, if you've seen some of the chat going on that, uh, she's been super helpful to people on, on, on this call already. So save your questions or stick them in the chat box and we'll come back to them when we, uh, get to the, towards the end of this we've got one more speaker to give uh, a little bit of insight on what they've been learning uh, and then we'll have time for Q&A and uh, there'll be an unofficial Q&A after four o'clock if anyone wants to stick around but moving on to our third speaker the uh, the next speaker uh, you almost certainly have seen on various things uh, for example founder of the STEMETS I'm sure Anne-Marie will say a bit more about that in a moment you may have seen her on the RI Christmas lectures that Hannah was delivering and Fran was organizing and Anne-Marie was uh, in front of the camera uh, doing some stuff with Hannah, ask her about that later. Also leader of the uh, Women Tech Charge podcast done by the Evening Standard. So without me taking any more time, can I hand over to Anne-Marie Imafadon? Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. You should be able to see my screen now. Yes, we can. Um, and it's a slightly sarcastic math mo's can learn anything because uh, this is often the response I get uh, whenever I want to learn anything new people are always like oh my gosh you know so much about maths and everything that must be easy for you um, so it's a bit of a sarcastic thing against them and um, so this is a little bit about me kind of in summary there are lots of different things that I do my, I've got my finger in lots of different pies but ultimately um, I'm a technologist um, who also loves maths and so I've ended up getting to do things like the podcast and get to speak uh, in front of the camera about technology and maths and their implications um, for life um, which is something that I feel really privileged to be able uh, to do. Just written a book actually called How to Be a Maths Whiz which I thought I'd throw in there with Dawn and Kindersley which was super exciting for me because I remember them from my childhood and they had all the amazing books um, but I'm also obsessed with kind of history um, and uh, innovators and what they look like and people who are kind of building our future um, is something I've become uh, obsessed with recently so when we talk about skills and learning new skills for me this is something um, in terms of encouraging other people and inviting other people to learn to do things like coding uh, this is the reason why um, it's for, for the people uh, like those that we've got on this slide I don't know how how many of you recognize four of them, maybe three of them, possibly two, maybe one. Spoiler alert, Marie Curie is not one of them. Um, but we've got lots of different people um, who've contributed to what we know STEM to be, STEM being science, technology, um, engineering and maths. And there are lots of reasons why we need lots more people to have some of these technical skills, these STEM skills uh, to help build the future and, and one that works for, for lots of us. Um, on this slide alone, I've got in the top left, me with slightly different hair stood next to John, um, who was the voice of Siri up until version iOS 8. Uh, and that's at the BET conference a couple of years ago. Uh, for me, it was, it's always cool to think about kind of voice recognition and the fact that we've had that around for decades and ye oldie Siri was a bit rubbish. And it's only now that I'm afraid to say Alexa out loud in, in, in case a device in someone's home kind of sets off. Um, in the top right hand, side, uh, right hand corner, we've got um, airbags and seat belts, which again were built by engineers who kind of took their chances on the 50th percentile male. And this is still an overhang we have till today's world, which is that if you're not the 50th percentile male, um, then seat belts and airbags aren't really built for you. Um, and our security ratings aren't even based on you. So um, if, for example, you're a woman, then you've always used seat belts and airbags incorrectly, um, which is a, a big shocker to have in mind. And then at the bottom, I always love talking about periods because I do, because we don't hear about them often enough in serious environments. Um, but lots of technology has been built around people's health um, in the last however many decades um, and every single time someone proclaims that they've discovered periods and then goes ahead to build uh, an app that only allows you to track for example 10 days of a period which if any of you have ever had a period before or met anyone who's ever had a period you'll know that they kind of just do their own thing um, and so when i talk about learning skills and building the future um my day job is that i run stemets and so i'm introducing girls and young women and non-binary young people 
um, to all that there is to offer across this world. We do run hackathons and we do run panels, but ultimately these are skills and these are things that everyone should be encouraged to do no matter what age they are. Um, and for me, it's because it's about building that future that's for all of us rather than one that's kind of very narrow and is only built with certain people in mind. I think the fun thing about learning to code though is that there are lots of options, lots of choices, and it can feel quite overwhelming. Um, couple that with the fact that technology is moving very quickly. So actually, there is a lot to learn. There is a lot uh, that even if you narrow in on virtual reality or narrow in on the Internet of Things, which is that Molly box in the top right hand corner, or look at robotics or anything else, there's quite a lot to choose. And actually, as time goes on, um, it only gets wider. It's not like you kind of master all the maths and then it's all done. Uh, there's constantly new things that are coming up, which can be a bit daunting and make it a bit frustrating when you're trying to pick up um, new skills. But also it does mean that uh, this idea of kind of picking it, learning these digital skills or learning these skills for fourth, the fourth industrial revolution um, is something that again is becoming less and less of a choice. So I talk quite a lot about digital being the fourth literacy and the fact that it's reading, writing, arithmetic and we're digital that we now need to kind of keep in mind as we're living in the 21st century because unfortunately even though you might not have chosen the pug life, the pug life has chosen you. So my kind of three tips that I want to kind of share with everyone before we go to kind of questions was firstly um, to learn with a tribe. Any skill that you're going to pick up, it's always easier to do it with others. With STEMATS, um, it is for under 25s. We, it is always free to attend for the girls and the young people. And there is always food. Um, unfortunately, I can't promise that in, in any other organization that you go to. But I think learning with others definitely makes it easier. It being a social experience is something um, that means that you are able to not just learn the core skill, but learn other people's perspectives as you're doing it. Um, and also learn how other people think about it. And um, so on the right hand side, I've got kind of physical spaces, maybe pre-lockdown and maybe post-lockdown that you might be able to tap into to, to be able to learn alongside others and Eventbrite and meetups are also fantastic for that. But on the left-hand side, a couple of online platforms for learning as well. Um, but try and make it as much as possible a social um, activity. I think um, they, they say, I mean, it's probably different now that we're in lockdown, but you know, it used to be that f only 5% of people finish MOOCs, massive online open courses, and that's because they're literally doing it on their own. So you set yourself up for more success if you're part of a group and you have other people that are holding you accountable. Second is to have a growth mindset about any skill that you're trying to learn, coding or otherwise. Um, it's I think, especially as a math mode, I think math is fantastic because it's so logical and you kind of learn things and you know you've learned it, but unfortunately life is a bit more complicated than maths. And so actually being comfortable with being uncomfortable and having a growth mindset is super important. You're not learning these skills to be the world's best Python coder, but you're learning it so you can better than you were yesterday. And so you can have a better of an understanding of what's, um, what's going on and what's coming. Um, in the same way that you didn't learn English to become Shakespeare, you learned it to understand the language of what was going on around you. And so as you're approaching this coding thing, um, you're always going to get better and I think also as a mathmo, assuming you are all mathmos on this, um, you probably have coded more than you think <laughs> is the other thing. It's part of a lot of university courses, it's part of a lot of what we do. So actually you're not really starting from zero and this is probably the small element of truth in mathmos can learn anything. It's because there's quite a lot of stuff that we've actually covered the basics of, which means that when you do come to learn to code, yeah, there's a lot of crossover and it'd be fairly easy. And then lastly, uh, is that coding is incredibly logical. So we, when we start off with the girls, we always um, start off with this exercise. And when we always start and say, coding is just like making jam sandwiches. Um, we could also say it's like making a cup of tea, which is slightly controversial because there are lots of different ways of making tea. But either way, you can all write a set of instructions that someone else could follow to get to the same end. And ultimately that's all coding is. Um, so if you're learning Python, which is normally the kind of the number one thing that people suggest that you start with, if you're learning Ruby on Rails, whatever it is that you're learning, um, if you see it just as that list of instructions um, and different ways to write the list of instructions and different cups of tea that you might end up making or different jam sandwiches that you might end up making, it will keep you sane um, and allow you to continue on. Um, so that was it really, that was my idea. Mathmos can learn pretty much anything. Um, and it's about the motivation, I think, more than even necessarily the platforms that you use, because different folks learn in different ways. And so there's not one particular way I suggest you do it. And that's it.
Lovely. Thanks very much, Anne-Marie. We've had three different contrasting viewpoints about learning new things, some of them overlapping. There's all sorts of stuff still to talk about. There are questions still appearing in the chat box. So I'm going to hand over to Sam Durbin to wrangle some of those questions, if that's okay, Sam. Uh, 